shares of Lupin doing this in the session. Uh, remember, from a 12-month perspective, this one has gained 131%. Today, cooling off a bit, uh, three quarters of a percent, so giving back some of those gains. Uh, the Indian Pharma giant posted a 52% jump in fourth quarter profits from a year ago. Revenues also up by about 12% on year to nearly 50 billion rupees. Uh, that is about 5,000 crore rupees, uh, so to speak. The company said U.S. sales remain healthy, driven by their inhalation products. Uh, they, are, uh, they are, of course, looking at the formulation segment very closely, which is also performing well. Ramesh Swaminathan is Global CFO and Executive Director at Lupin, joining us with his take on things. Uh, Ramesh, lovely to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. The, the bottom line was very, very impressive, 52% growth, uh, but that did not uh, kind of add up uh, to the top line performance. The top, top line performance did not commensurate uh, with, uh, with that number, percentage growth, 12% higher. Uh, could you take us through the quarter and what can we watch out for in, in the new financial year? Yeah, the fourth quarter is not very different from what you had actually seen in the previous three quarters. You know, a continuous increase in terms of our profitability. Um, there's buoyancy in the, at the top line also. Uh, but the fact is Q4 is indeed a weak quarter for, uh, for uh, countries like India. You know, there are, of course, countries like Philippines and uh, South Africa where it does extremely well. Um, and, of course, the most important market, America, continue to do pretty well for us in Q4 as well. In the back of, in fact, uh, good launches in the recent past, which of course includes Spiriva, uh, it has Albertol, which continues to do well. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's uh, secular growth across various markets uh, and um, on expected lines with uh, markets like India. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, it's important to kind of, uh, you know, point out the fact that our, uh, our manufacturing margins were on the increase. The gross margins increased by about uh, 1.5 percentage points. We also mm -hmm. had, in fact, uh, you know, kept a tight leash on various costs, uh, especially mm -hmm. if you look at, in fact, uh, you know, the other expenses, it came down to about 30.3 percent. Um, and uh, consequently, a bit of margins went up to 20.4 percent. Uh, there was also an impairment charge that we took during the course of uh, this quarter. Uh, this is essentially fixed assets that we're not using and some, uh, um, you know, and as products in America and in India, which we are not marketing at this stage. Uh, but for that, the overall net profits would have been certainly much, much higher. But, um, you know, enough to state that uh, there is, uh, of course, tremendous buoyancy on the top line, uh, exhibiting the same kind of uh, behavior that at the bottom line. And, of course, Visa with uh, previous uh, periods, it's, it's a very, very comfortable uh, uh, situation. Right. Your investment in R&D stands at about 8.7% of sales. Uh, is that, I mean, what's the benchmark here? Is that uh, the trend? Are you going to be looking at allocating more given your profitability has increased, your margins have increased, uh, given that the top line growth looks, in your words, uh, buoyant? Yes, the you know the R and D is really a reflection of the kind of products that you're working on, uh, and you must have certainly you know, discerned the recent quarters. Uh, we are aligning ourselves to more complex products, which is essentially in the inhalation space, in the injectable space, and and you could also include biosimilars and the like. Um, so um, there's of course a bit of um, higher spends in in uh, recent quarters because of litigation spends, but in a general sense, the R and D bill is really reflective of. Uh, you know, the kind of depth that you're bringing to our overall portfolio for the future. And that is uh, what is causing the R&D bill to go up. Uh, actually, as a percentage of sales, we would certainly be reigning it at a particular level. Uh, it would not necessarily go up to, uh, you know, it might actually continue for a, a few quarters, but it's not certainly in a reflective of very long-term trends. Uh, the absolute numbers could go up, but uh, as a percentage of sales, it will certainly be contained over time for sure. But um, what is certainly secular and will continue is the pivoting to more complex products, uh, injectables and inhalations, which uh, we really have identified as our uh, as, a, as our uh, growth strategy for the future. And there, of course, we spend some speciality going forward. Can I just ask you, Ramesh, because, you know, for at least the, the, the past couple of quarters that the U.S. revenues in terms of formulation specifically have been bigger than everything else. Do you foresee, though, you know, because India has been catching up in terms of your, your net revenue there, do you foresee that as far outpacing the US moving forward, considering all of the demographic shifts in India, considering the, the nature with which people are, you know, taking up medical services now, they're, they're, they've got more access to health care, and obviously then more access to your products? 
I think the two most important markets for us will continue to be India and America. You know, they are very, very different kind of markets. Whilst uh, America is, uh, is, uh, is important from, in fact, uh, uh, you know, more complex products and, of course, uh, you know, slant towards, uh, you know, and uh, the alignment is really towards injectables and, uh, uh, and, and inhalations. India is a little more secular across various therapy areas, cardiovascular, diabetes, uh, you know, uh, GI, um, you know, uh, or those are the areas that we are, uh, and respiratory, of course, is what we are kind of focusing on in India. Uh, India is more of a patient-centric approach also, where we have got, a, uh, you know, a lot of adjacencies lined up, which is essentially in the diagnostic space, in the digital space. We also have a wellness program uh, that we run. We have a, you know, a neuro rehabilitation center that you're building up and the like. So uh, India is slightly different from a paradigm perspective, whilst, uh, of course, the overall thrust is indeed on, uh, on generics, both in India and other parts of the world. Uh, the dominating theme will continue to be that, though, of course, we're building on certain other adjacencies in India. Really quickly, can I just ask you, if we were to see an administration change in the United States, do you foresee that as impacting your, your core business at all? Because obviously with a, you know, a Trump administration versus a Biden administration, the, the legislative needs of different administrations change as it relates to healthcare, or do you think that whatever situation comes, that it's basically not going to impact your business there all that much? Uh, we are in the business of affordable medicine, bringing access to medicines to vast uh, uh, you know, swaths of the population. Uh, and from uh, our perspective, irrespective of, in fact, who is in power, uh, the policies can't impact us tremendous, uh, you know, too much, really, because essentially it is going to be uh, the need of, in fact, the society. So affordable medicine is certainly going to be the thrust for uh, any administration which comes in, because essentially uh, it's all about actually, you know, making sure that uh, medicines are available to uh, larger, you know, sections of the people uh, at an affordable cost for sure. And, um, um, and, and that's, uh, you know, so we would be rather immune to uh, what's happening at the, at, the, at the top level from a political perspective. Very much politics proof. Ramesh, thank you so much for making the time. Congratulations once again on the queue for numbers. Now, before we go, there's a big set of numbers coming through later tonight as well. We're all going to have eyes on Disney 